Hi there, I'm going to comment on Chapter 6 of Lila by Robert M. Persick. This chapter is meant to describe the experience of someone embedded in a traditional way of thinking, where mystical understanding is irrelevant and imaginary. Yet what they perceive as concrete, which is fixed moral values, are not as concrete as they think. This is going to set us up for a debate concerning morals, that Regal will represent one side and Phaedrus the other. And this is a dialectic to get to the truth ultimately about what quality is. The problem is the two of them have such differing understandings of reality to begin with, a consensus is going to be really difficult. And Regal sees Phaedrus's quality as sinister, a pseudo-mystical entity, and threatening. So you could say, in fact, with a lot of certitude, that dynamic quality is mystic, which is pre-intellectual. It, it just comes to you. But the metaphysical quality includes static qualities just as important as dynamic. They're just two sides that interact with each other. It's the track and the train. So in Persig's philosophy, the social system has value. Regal's social morals have value, but they can become stale and rigid and outdated. And so when that happens, people like Regal, who are deeply invested in these systems, whose identity is contingent on these systems, fight righteously to maintain them. Remember in Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, right before Phaedra starts having his breakthroughs, that he is extremely invested in the Church of Reason. Fanatically so. So let me read this passage from chapter 13 of Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. You are never dedicated to something you have complete confidence in. No one is fanatically shouting that the sun is going to rise tomorrow. They know it's going to rise tomorrow. When people are fanatically dedicated to political or religious faiths or any other kinds of dogmas or goals, it's always because these dogmas or goals are in doubt. So when Friedrich is fanatical about the the truth about reason, it's because in the back of his mind he's doubting it. And at this time that this book was written, there was a lot of doubt as to how useful this rigid moral system was. And Regal must have realized that there was a lot of opposition to it and potentially unconsciously felt some doubt himself. We don't have much evidence of that in this chapter, although I think if you parse through it, you probably could find some. I wasn't able to, but maybe someone else has a different idea. And it's these reactions, these fanatical reactions, that should remind you of, for example, other attempts to maintain any dying pattern. Practically nobody wants racism, and everybody wants it to decrease. Yet look at the desperation to keep an old concept of racism alive. You know, that kind of 50, 40s Jim Crow concept of racism that this still actually exists. I mean, how many people do you know, really, that think black people are inferior? It is such a small minority. Yet a book like White Fragility, for example, is trying to re-up that notion of racism and keep it alive. And there's, you know, some reasons for that because people in this camp usually have good intentions and are good souls because they are they are worried that if you if you don't see racism as this as this, you know, that racism still exists in this toxic form, then if you let your guard down, racism might increase. And that's an understandable fear, but there's no flexibility in there for a solution. And the fear stems from, I think, that the zeitgeist that says that this pattern is evolving into something else, less potent racism of the sort that that is, you know, let's just say classic racism, and into something else that isn't necessarily racially oriented like it once was. It may be more class oriented, it may be shifting economy, it may be any number of things. I think the solution to something like this might B, if you were to look at it through the lens of, of Persig's philosophy, that you need to be aware of what's going on and let this update naturally and evolve and get better. And how it's evolving and getting better is really hard to say, but if you try to, if you try to pin it down and put it behind a wall, it's not going to update. You're just going to perpetuate something that shouldn't, that really needs to be changed. 
Um, some people may not agree with me, and maybe there's a case to be made for that in this particular uh, question of racism. The moral question in this book is of similar complexity, and there is one particular moral question, and it's going to be introduced in this chapter. So Regel's concern is that qualities, or Phaedrus's quality at least, is anything you like, and certainly in Zen the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, Phaedrus toyed with that for a while to arrive to the conclusion that in fact it's not anything you like. Optimally, what Regel and Phaedrus could try to do is to come to some kind of consensus about how much quality is left in in Regal's social system, how much can we actually use, how much is working, and, and how much do we need to toss out. But the problem is they can't even communicate. I think Persig purposely makes Phaedrus into someone who appears like a boar to provide the contrast because I think that the character of Robert in Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance would have been more forthcoming about what he was thinking and conciliatory. But also Phaedrus is deeply embedded in working out this this theory, the metaphysics of quality in this book, and he seems to be flabbergasted that he's dealing with someone who's so obtuse about quality. So this chapter starts with Regal deciding after being woken up in the middle of the night by, of course, Lila and uh, and Phaedrus stumble across his deck because the, the boats are tied up together and Regal's pissed off that that Phaedrus continues to tie his boat to Regal's, which is something Regal let him do at some other juncture, and he continues to do it without permission. So he's irritated about that. All night long, in and out, in and out, the wakes from passing boats cause that author's barge next to him to push his own boat in and out against the dock like a railroad Pullman car, and there was nothing he could do about it. He could have gotten up and adjusted the author's lines himself, but that wasn't his job. Nothing he could do about it. Not in his moral system, he can't. He'd rather suffer than let someone off the hook for something that they should have done. And he's angry at Phaedrus's lack of manners and uh, points out what a bore he is. So this is telling us something else about Regal, something about his standards. We already know he's pretty concerned about morality and is quite judgmental. Like, remember in chapter one, he has this idea of good Canadians and bad Canadians, and here's the list of what good Canadians are, and here's the list of what bad Canadians are. It fits into his moral system. He's also extremely conscientious, and we'll see this described in a second as he gets ready uh, to go meet Phaedrus. Uh, as he's getting ready, I want to read this passage. The water was steaming hot, but there wasn't much satisfaction in that now. Two years ago, it had cost him an arm and a leg to have this hot water system installed. He had to wait a whole summer for it. Now he was selling the boat. Everything changes. Nothing is predictable anymore. So in this phrase, note, he can't enjoy this boat because in a little bit it's going to be gone. And that's really, when you think about it, kind of preposterous. Why can't he enjoy his boat while he has it? So please think of the Buddhist notion of dukkha and also what he's saying about nothing is predictable, everything changes. Wanting things to be predictable, to line up with preconceived notions, to be safe, is suffering. That is the definition of grasping. That's the definition of desire. So let's just say that dukkha, the origin of dukkha is preconceived notions, and I think that's about right. Preconceived notions are gumption traps when they just sit there stuck. He thought the great author's respectful readers should have seen him last night dancing with Lila. They probably wouldn't have minded, though. Among his respectful readers, drunkenness and whoring were probably considered some form of quality. And this is the reaction that conservatives of this era, remember this book is written you know, over the course of 20 years and is published in 1990, uh, had to liberals. And you see this with, you know, in the 80s, for example, the family values people, the Reaganites, the Bushites, the God and country people certainly would not condone drunken dancing with bar girls like some hippie degenerate. So listen to this paragraph to uh, get a real, a real sense of Regal. Now clean and shaven, Richard Regal felt a little better. He watched in the mirror as he combed his hair into respectability, then tried on a tie. It didn't look right. With Cary Grant features like his own, it would be inappropriate to be overdressed, particularly in a place like this. He removed his tie, unbuttoned the collar, and carefully opened it a little. Carefully opened it a little. Much better. So he's so married to this 
system of uh, social appropriateness that he's not going to upplay his Cary Grant features. Regal was first going to meet Phaedrus to talk to him about this boat line situation, but actually there's something else he really wants to address that's really eating at him. So at breakfast he addresses it. It's none of my business whom you select for company, he said. You seem to pay no attention to me at all last night, but I think I have an obligation to advise you one last time to get Lila off your boat. They have a little exchange, and Phaedrus mumbles that she might be better than she looks. Richard Regal contradicted him. No, Lila is much worse than she looks. She's a very unfortunate person of low quality, he said. At the word quality, the author looked as though it was some kind of challenge thrown at him. It was, of course. And that starts the whole dialectic where they both each make a case for their worldviews and for quali- for their notion of what quality is. Regal is absolutely sure Lila is of low quality, using an example that clearly defines this for Regal. And that is that Lila, with her degenerate ways, ruined the life of a married man that she was involved with. And Regal talks about the situation which you actually might associate with the oppressive 50s. You know, what was wrong with this moral system in the 50s? That if someone had an affair or, you know, made a moral faux pas with a bar lady, it could cost you your job and cost you your reputation and certainly cost you your marriage. And so he describes this banker whose downfall was Lila, and it's kind of like a Victorian novel, think human bondage. I knew of human bondage was a little later than a Victorian era, but it, it represents that, uh, that dynamic. At least the story does. But then Phaedrus asks a confounding question. And this question to Regal is absolutely nonsensical. Who was to blame, he said. Feeder said. What do you mean, Richard Regal asked? I mean, was it Lila who was to blame for your friend's misfortune, or was it his wife and his so-called friends and his superiors at the bank? Who really did him in? I don't follow, Richard Regal said. Was it her love, or was it their hatred? I wouldn't call it love. Would you call it hatred on their part? What exactly did he do to them that justified their hatred? Now you're no longer being naive, Richard Regal said. You're being deliberately stupid. Are you going to tell me that his wife had no right to be angry? This is the Victorian fallen woman archetype, and that's how Regal sees her, and he has no pity for her. She's someone who deliberately violated social norms for her own pleasure and is the biggest sinner of all. And the banker, because he was contrite, he was forgiven, but he still lost everything. It really is that classic story. So for Phaedrus, what transpired between these two people isn't necessarily a moral evil and can't be pinpointed as the source of the problem. This is a whole ecosystem. Why is the act only the act immoral? This act has been going on since creatures needed two entities to reproduce. What about the reactions of the bank and the banker's wife? Why are their responses indicative of a right morality and the love between Lila and the banker or not? It's a good question. The way this case is being presented is ambiguous as hell because most people reading the book in the 90s when it came out are going to be the people who probably think Regal's morality is outdated and unrealistic and even oppressive. Yet it's really hard not to side with the wife and it's really hard to see Lila in a favorable light. She's already been illustrated as someone who's really quite objectionable. And this is what makes this moral investigation of her as as one of the main bases for this book so ingenious. It's just a messy situation. And there's there's arguments, and you're seeing two of them right now, to be made for and against. Well, we don't really know what the argument for her, um, for Lila, is quite yet. That's that's going to emerge, and this is going to help us understand metaphysics equality. But it's great material for an inquiry into morals. And you can see how this has that complexity that the racism problem has now. There's always been something wrong logically, the author went on. How can an act of love that does no injury to anyone be so evil? Think about it. Who was injured? 
Richard Regal thought about it. He said it wasn't an act of love. Lila Blewett doesn't know what love means. It was an act of deceit. And so later he says, trying to clarify what he means by this, he said, let me try another word, honor. The person we are talking about dishonored his wife and he dishonored his children and he dishonored everyone who put trust in him. And right, right this moment, you feel your hackles going up because it, it doesn't make sense to us now that someone having an affair should lose his job. Although, again, at the same time, we're kind of, you know, we're for and against this. And the violation of social norms, especially sexual ones for Regal, is dishonor. The use of the word honor gives us kind of a feeling of an archaic value system because when does that word come up much anymore? And let me insert a bit of opinion. It was the complete jettisoning of things like honor and respect and loyalty and that kind of higher social principle that it seems we're really starting to crave again in the midst of, of this chaos that's happening now. So what Regal is talking about, his moral system isn't all bad. The hippies rejected his value system outright, and now we see this movement winding up in these violent protests, ultimately. But the purported desire of this group who are protesting and, and this whole movement is one of a desire for honor and respect. So there's a pattern underneath this that is still has some traction. So one thing that I like about, about reading the chapter first and then doing the commentary later is that I'll get comments in the reading section, and that helps me do the commentary section. So in the comments, uh, Paul pointed out that what we're seeing is a trial. Regal is, uh, is the prosecutor. Phaedrus is the defending attorney. Lila is the, uh, is, is the suspect or the, I forget what you call it, but you know what I mean. And Capella sitting there neutrally is the jury. He's a neutral observer of the arguments for and against stepping outside this moral system or what is quality or who did Lila hurt or, or um, the real question is going to come up in a minute, but who did she hurt? Capella asked. Regal looked at Bill with surprise. Him too. He thought Capella was more sensible. It was a sign of the times. It is a sign of the times. It's this zeitgeist. Well, there are some of us left, he said, returning to the author, who are still holding out against your hedonistic quality philosophy or whatever it is. So Regal thinks that quality can... Remember the line... In aesthetics, quality can be spooned and forked up. So Regal is kind of looking at quality that way. He thinks there are different kinds of quality, and he's not seeing that quality is the mechanism, not the manifestation. And that's what makes Persick's philosophy so important now, because amidst this chaotic fragmentation we're seeing, let's say, we need something directing us towards what's good, because the facts we're getting, all this material, all this chaos, cannot provide us with any answer. We don't need someone to tell us what's what well, we don't have someone to tell us what's good because there are too many opinions there are too many facts we need to be able to figure out what's good for ourselves so there's something to be said for people wanting to maintain systems if we throw everything out like the hippies did or ken wilbur remember boomeritis the green level the postmodern types did we have no uniting argument uh we have no uniting agreement as to what is uh, what is moral. And Persig has pointed out that the hippies were too destructive and too dynamic. We have that particular understanding of freedom, which is throw, you throw out everything that's bad and start again. That is freedom to this understanding. Plus cultural relativism, plus on top of it, technology disseminating things at such a rapid rate and no consensus of what's good anymore. So what do you do in that case? Well, what you do is you develop a system for figuring out what's good. You don't develop a system for figuring out what's true. Out of all these facts, you're never going to be able to do it. Persick provides that system. You made a statement in your book that everyone knows and agrees to what quality is. Obviously, everyone, everyone does not. My exact statement was that people do disagree as to what quality is, but their disagreement is only in the objects in which they think quality inheres. What's the difference? Quality, on which there is complete agreement, is the universal source of things. The objects about what pe people disagree about are merely transitory. Well, that's going to drive Regal up the wall. Remember, that's 
remember that the reason Phaedrus opposed the dialectic in the Phaedrus dialogue was that it was motivated. It was an unfolding of truth where the two parties get, get wiser. So Regal is being a lawyer. He's arguing his case. He doesn't want to hear the other side. He's waiting for traps, and he's waiting to dis dislodge Phaedrus's argument, all the while not realizing that we are seeing Phaedrus dislodge his argument. But Regal's not going to see that. Also, I think we ought to look at the word conservative and what it actually means. Conservatives in general tend to value social standards over, over what liberals value and they tend to be tribal. I don't know what the word liberal and conservative mean today, and it seems like none of us really do anymore. It really is a topsy-turvy world. So it's interesting to see this, this um, exchange between an older conservative viewpoint and, and something more like a liberal viewpoint. Because nowadays, and let's go back to why Persig's philosophy is so important to us now. Is you, if you can't tell the difference between conservative and liberal, which you can't, then you're really going to need a different system for figuring out how to operate in the world. Anyway, Regal is one of those conservatives who don't like the Cultural Revolution of the 60s one bit and associates Persig's work with the denizens of that culture. And it's funny because a lot of people do that when they see the titles in, in The Art of Motorcycle Maintenance they, and they hear it's about quality. So the decision people make about this book is that it's a hippie manifesto. And to top it off, the great author says quality is the universal source of things. And as it turns out that we've discovered... What quality is in Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, the way Phaedrus frames it, isn't cosmic or, mystic, or mystical, or, or well, it is mystical in that way that we were talking about, but it's not, you know, airy-fairy or new age. It's the way reality is structured, and it's the way our cognition is structured. And when you finish reading Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, you, you kind of have to ask yourself how you didn't see this earlier. It becomes so clear. It isn't, you know, it isn't uh, new agey at all. So how per Persik's philosophy is understood here and what it actually means is a demonstration of two entirely different worldviews. Again, again, Phaedrus is, is presented as less aware of Regal's position than he actually is to embody the point of view of the metaphysics of quality. Obviously, it's really frustrating for Phaedrus um, and for us to see Regal trapped like that. Phaedrus knows that by updating one's perception of reality, you come to a much more fruitful place of being able to get in touch with that seminal experience of quality and then to express it in the best way possible, depending on what's in your own boxcars, let's say. In terms of the metaphysics of quality, Regal cannot see anything coming out of the mystical universal source of things. To him, this is a communication from the devil to overthrow society, and the great author's book is a call to do so. You are in contact with this universal source of things, aren't you? Yes, said the author. You are too, if you don't, if you'd understand it. Well, I'm trying, says Richard Regal, but you are just going to have to help me a little. This universal source of things, moreover, tells you what's good and what's not good, doesn't it? Isn't that right? Did God tell you that Miss Lila M. Blewett of Rochester, New York, with whom you stumbled across my deck at two this morning, has quality? What God? Forget God. Do you personally think Miss Lila M. Blewett is a woman of quality? Yes. Richard Regal stopped. He hadn't expected this answer, which, of course, for Regal, proves the notion of quality is total bunk. Lila is so obviously low quality. How the hell can Phaedrus give that answer? And actually, this is a very difficult question because it's hard, for, again, it's hard for those of us on Phaedrus' side to see this quality in Lila. We, Lila is really objectionable on every level as far as we can tell. So we don't really know where he's going with this right now. He's not going to explain what he means at this point in the book. This is the beginning of an inquiry. Then how do you define it? Richard Regal settled back in his chair. To begin with, he said, quality that is independent of experience doesn't exist. I've done very well without it all these years, and I'm sure I will continue without any difficulty whatsoever. The author interrupted. I didn't say quality was independent of experience. So they both agree that quality is experienced. And this argument should be the beginning of a shared understanding of quality, but in fact the underlying metaphysics of the respective belief systems are not going to allow for any agreement. All they can agree on is that, that 
is this one thing, but that's where it ends. So when Regel defines quality, he first says that it's an experience of specific things, of objects, but then he goes on to say that in general it's found in values. Now this contradiction was again pointed out by Paul in the comment section. I think the reason for this contradiction is to set Regel up as someone who is seeing things through the worldview that sees subjects and objects. So just by intuition, he's going to say specific things, but the truth of what is valuable to him is the social mores he lives in, is this social code, this moral code, and he's absolutely meticulous about what's appropriate, as you remember from the Cary Grant episode. And what's most important to him is a certitude of what's right and wrong. It's wrong to allow your boat to slam into another boat all night. Most of us would agree with that. But with Regal, he's so offended by the boat slamming into his boat, he's, he's not going to get up and uh, he's not going to absolve the author of his duty. He's just going to suffer all night. We don't agree with this. So there's like one element of his moral system that works and one element that's just, you know, it's too far gone. Regal, as a lawyer, is familiar with people who don't share this moral system. He calls them criminals. And what really sets him off about the author is that he believes the people who got into Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, this hippie manifesto, are immoral draft dodgers, etc. Uh, because you remember that when this book came out, that was uh, right at the tail end of Vietnam. You talked for chapter after chapter about how to preserve the underlying form of a motorcycle, but you didn't say a single word about how to preserve the underlying form of society. Of course, since Persik's philosophy is universal, that it is about the universal source of things. Preserving underlying form is transferable. This whole motorcycle thing was just a metaphor for how everything operates. And as we're going to see coming up here, Phaedrus does value social patterns, but they have to have enough flexibility to update. and. Regal is caught in that social immune system, so he has to defend his social values in a diehard, rigid approach. Change is too threatening, but for Regal, the whole purpose of Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, again, is to promote the belief that quality is anything you like, which means that morality, if, if quality is anything you like, then morality is irrelevant. And according to Regal, if, if morality is irrelevant, then Phaedrus is doing the devil's work. It's not the devil's work I'm doing, said the author. You're trying to do what has quality, isn't that right? Yes, the author said. Well, do you see what happens when you get involved in fine-sounding words that nobody can define? That's why we have laws to define what quality is. These definitions may not be as perfect as you'd like them, but I can promise you they're a whole lot better than having everybody run around doing as he pleases. We've seen the results of that. And then he's thinking to himself, maybe he should write a book about quality and what it really was. Then, so that's the, so let's talk about the big question. The big question, does Lila Blewett have quality? He thinks he has Phaedrus now. How can Phaedrus possibly say yes? So at this point, they're going to have to kind of give up. They're not getting anywhere. So all Regal can do is point out how Phaedrus' isolation might be why he doesn't see this truth before him, this truth of communal values. And to some extent, we see a grain of truth in this. We know that Phaedrus is very isolated, and the way he behaves in this novel, unlike Robert, who was in society, and, and Phaedrus is, is kind of isolated, we, can, we see a grain of truth in this. Again, you can't completely dispense with Regal's take on reality, but you really get a sense of being constrained. The author agrees he's isolated, but we also know that it's that detachment that allows him to also step out of this thing, on the other hand, step out of this thing and see what's going on. And to understand that Lila's quality, which we don't know about yet, is not going to be in the domain of what uh, Regal considers quality. In fact, Regal's entire system is to guard against whatever kind of quality Lila supposedly has. But the author's insight, genius, and detachment does isolate him from society, so he's not going to have an effective way to counter Regal's claims. This is how he's framed in this book. For all his genius, he's socially inept, and this is something he's pointed out regularly. 
So all he has is his book, which Regal doesn't understand. And in fact, a lot of people didn't understand it, which is why in Lila he's going to spell it out. And which is also why this book was less popular and less entertaining. But I've heard from many viewers um, who say that this is the superior book. So I guess it depends if it's valuable to you. Again, if you have the sense that quality is some kind of fixed code of aesthetics or of ethics, you're missing the point. Value is subjective and objective at the same time. It's dynamic and static at the same time. But it's really going to depend on which context or mythos or biology or, or the entity detecting quality is embedded in. And, by the way, is a hint to truly understand people. Because to truly understand people, you have to understand their values. This means in order to understand people, you have to temporarily at least suspend any belief in any fixed system. When you are assessing someone, when you're really trying to figure them out, you have to experience their values, at least intellectually. You know, you have to understand their values. And that does require a certain detachment, a certain stepping back, a certain suspension of your own value system. Whether their system works well or not is a different story. It's either headed towards improvement or it's not. But that doesn't have anything to do with whether they are detecting quality or not. We all detect quality all the time. It has to do with traps. I'm surprised that you listened to me just now, Richard Regal said, as they walked toward their boats at the dock. I don't really think you were capable of that. So little does he know that listening, in my opinion, is at the core of Fiedrich's applied philosophy because you have to let what's best, what the next step is, guide you and you have to be connected to it so you really do have to be present and aware and listening. And listening is something Regal again only does in a motivated way, waiting for something he can latch onto to bolster his case like Socrates does with, uh, with Fiedrich in the, in the Fiedrich dialogue. Earlier in the debate, Regel waves his hand to quiet Phaedrus's objection when Regel states that those who don't operate in his system are criminals. And of course, he's equating the hippie draft dodgers of criminality, and you know he puts Lila in that category. Yes, he says it's right and proper in our code of ethics to allow others to have their opinion, whether we agree with them or not. So he's acknowledging that it's good manners to allow disagreement. But change is only possible within the system. We can only change the law within the law, not outside of it. So any kind of change that has to happen has to go through the system. As the boats came into view, they saw Lila standing on the deck of his boat. She waved at them. They all waved back. So after Regal berates Lila behind her back extensively, he gives her a friendly wave when he sees her. That's good manners. So I hope that made sense, and I'll see you next time.